everybody to this is off now. You're on. Just go. Start talking. Well, welcome everybody to this afternoon's session. We now have Benno Weiss talking about a brief history of I.O. So please welcome Benno. So I'm just going to start off by saying two things. Firstly, this I've presented this talk before, but it was all in a one-hour slot. Uh, this means uh, two things. One, I'm not going to be taking any questions at the end. Uh, please come find me outside. And secondly, um, I'm going to be moving at a fair clip, um, possibly even more so towards the end. Um, so this is a talk about something that I find endlessly fascinating, which is how bits of computers talk to other bits of computers, or how computers talk to other computers, and so on and so forth. Um, I am the kind of person who could go on about this until you're all asleep, um, but I've tried to pick some of the more interesting bits. Um, so one of the themes that I'm going to go through is how the way you talk to something can be completely independent of the way you actually connect to it over a physical interface. This shows up in a bunch of places. Another one is how performance and cost can act as drivers on design in terms of hardware and various things. And the fact that everything eventually turns into a packetized switch net switched network. Um, and so just to illustrate this, I thought I'd start with Ethernet. Um, but I hear you say Ethernet is a packetized switch network, to which I say it is now. <laughs> um, Ethernet used to look like that. Um, so that there is a vampire tap with a bit of coaxial cable, and that there is a connector known as AUI, which you know, people of a certain age will recognise. Oh, <laughs> so original Ethernet ran at 2.94 megabits per second over, over that kind of cable, and the, the connectors were really annoying. If you if you adjusted them too many times, put moved them on the cable, your cable eventually went to crap, and you had to replace it. Um, and it was also a shared medium. So there was a shared electrical connection between every station on the network. Um, so this required the use of a thing that was known as CSMA CD, or carrier sense multiple access with collision detection. Um, the carrier sense multiple access part refers to the fact that every station on the network could talk on that network, and, um, and that they'd listen to see if anyone was talking first, which is the carrier sense part. Um, but of course, occasionally people do talk at the same time, and so that's where the collision detection came in. There was a preamble that was broadcast before the start of a packet, which is literally just a bit pattern that went out. And so you would send that out and you would listen as you were sending it. And if it came back garbled, it meant two people tried to talk, you'd back off and then try again in a little bit. Um, so this, was, uh, this continued on, this kind of format continued on. That's, this is 10 base 2. This replaced uh, 10 base 5, which was the... Uh, the vampire tap version. Now, again, people of a certain age will recognise our dear friends, the T-pieces and the Terminators. Um, and this was a bit easier to use. The coax was a bit cheaper, a um, bit more reliable. Um, eventually, though, someone came up with the bright idea of, of using uh, unshielded twisted pair, um, which is where we start to see the Ethernet connector we know and love. Um, but again, when 10Base-T, which was the first um, standard that used this, showed up, people still you were using hubs rather than switches, which still meant you were using a shared medium. Um, a hub just basically connects the ports together, whereas a switch will actually store the packet and forward it on. Um, and this was important because as the networks got larger, the probability of collisions became higher and higher. And so switches helped fix that by not actually allowing them to collide. You'd just receive the packet and then send it on. It also enabled the use of full duplex connections where a station could be sending and receiving at the same time. Um, all of this kind of obviated the need for the CMA CD stuff, but the preamble that was part of it is still there. Um, another interesting thing is that while all these underlying physical changes were going on, and the physical sp layer specifications for more recent higher speed versions of Ethernet look very different. This is a... Uh, a 10 gigabit um, optic module, and that there is, I think, a 40 gigabit uh, direct copper attached cable. Um, the actual API of Ethernet has not really changed that much. It's still a source address, a destination address, a type code, some data, and maybe a checksum. Uh, the only real changes that we've seen are things like adding VLAN and VXLAN tagging to um, be able to logically separate networks. But there haven't been too many changes due to the actual underlying physical stuff. And one last bit of random trivia, the 10 base T nomenclature to describe physical layers is part of a standard. So 10 base T was 10 megabit per second over category three twisted pair. Uh, the first bit represents the speed, as you kind of guess from the fact that it goes from 10 to 100 to whatever. Um, 
you know, you go up to 1,000, and then you go to 10G because writing 10,000 is too hard. Um, there are other connector standards. Instead of T, you can get SR and LR for short and long range fibre. There's KR for black panes, uh, CR for twinax, copper cabling, and so on and so forth. Um, the middle part always seems to be base though, and that's because that means baseband, which means you're using the entire signalling capacity of the medium. The alternative is broadband, which means you're sharing it. There was precisely one broadband Ethernet standard. It ran over cable TV coax and no one ever used it. <laughs> so moving on to, the, to some other stuff, software. Um, the first computers were used to do big bits of mathematics that had previously been done by hand. Uh, we're talking calculating things like tide tables or rocket trajectories or trigonometric tables or things like that. The first business applications were all about accounting and statistics and various things like that. Um, which meant that the primary applications tended to be more record oriented, something more like a database or a spreadsheet than a, than a file. Um, a lot of the early mainframe I.O. mechanisms were all about reading in punch cards and writing out results either to more punch cards or to printers. Um, the original notion of a file system showed up with storage devices like tapes um, and then later floppy drives and hard drives. But that was a lot of the mainframe versions of these were still more about organizing records. Um, file systems evolved to become a lot more generalized, but the echoes of this remain um, in that a lot of I.O. routines that existed on mainframe operating systems are record oriented, which, led to, which can lead to some fairly complex AIs because records have very different shapes and a bunch of other things. And then a bunch of lads in uh, at, uh, Bell Labs came up with Unix. That's the guts of Unix's I.O. model. Um, you open files, you close files. You read files, you write files. You might need to reposition them. And for everything else, there's for console, which <laughs> sounds terrible. Um, um, there are other calls too, like MMAP for memory mapping and IOCTAL for, for trying to configure devices that you might be talking to. But this is the majority that you're going to use when you're just dealing with data on a Unix system. Um, and one of the cornerstones of the approach was that you could treat other I.O. devices like serial ports or even network sockets or pipes the same way you do files. Um, and Unix was really influential, mainly because it was it was eventually very easy to port um, and because it was one of the first operating systems written in a language other than machine specific assembler and because the source code was readily available just due to the accidents of its birth. Um, there were legal constraints on its then owner AT&T which meant that they pretty much had to give it to anyone who wanted it. Um, and that meant that this very simple and very byte oriented API spread all over the place. And one of the places that it ends up is at University of California at Berkeley, where it forms the basis of the BSD operating systems, which is relevant because that's where TCP IP came from. And more importantly, where the socket IP I come, came from, which allows you to treat network sockets as you would any other kind of file once you've called the relevant other stuff. Um, so the fundamental characteristics of the Unix IO model, as you find in most common Unixes, and like the actual sort of common lingua franca, as you, if, if you want, is that I.O. is byte oriented, synchronous, and by default blocking. Um, we covered byte oriented versus record, record oriented, sort of, um, but let's talk about the other ones. Blocking I.O. means that when you request to read or write something, that the call doesn't return until it's done, which is fine when you say just you, you're doing like a transactional, like an HTTP client. You write some stuff out to the server, it sends stuff back, you read it, you, so on and so forth. It's less good when you're talking about stuff that's bidirectional, like web sockets or an HTTP server where you're dealing with multiple uh, connections at a time. Um, Unix has a way around blocking though. You can mark file descriptors as non-blocking, which means that if it wasn't able to perform an operation, it could either do what it could or that's flagged that something wasn't completed and you could try again. Um, to, work, to then work across multiple descriptors or to work out whether you should be reading or writing at any point, um, you've got the select API, which is the top one. Uh, I apologize for the formatting of this. It's the limitation of the uh, software I'm using. Um, the problem with select is that th those FD set arguments, which detail all of the file descriptors you're interested in, have to be shoved across the user kernel boundary every time you call select, which can re result in some large copies. Um, Paul addresses some of this by having just one array of file descriptors and allowing you to flag read and write on both, on all of them, um, as opposed to having to have them in separate sets, but it's still kind of annoying. Um, 
And the fun part of this is that the discovery of this lack of scalability of these interfaces kind of coincided after Unix stopped being a sort of common language or at least wasn't being developed as a common language as such anymore. And so that led to multiple different approaches. If you look at the BSD operating systems, they have KQ and KEvent. Um, this turned up and was proposed as something that should go into Linux and Linux said, no, I don't like that one, I'm going to make my own. Um, and so that leads to the development of things like ePoll. Um, both of these are, are far more capable and performant than Select and Poll, mainly because they allow persistent registration of interest in events. So instead of having to shove file descriptors back and forth over the kernel, constant, the kernel user boundary constantly, um, you can just say, I, I want to know when I should read this one and it'll tell you. But the other part of this is asynchrony. Um, select and poll and the various evolutions of those allow for a lack of blocking I.O. But what they don't provide necessarily is asynchronous I.O. And asynchronous I.O. is another area in Unix systems where there are a bunch of different ways of doing it that are all slightly different. Um, another way of doing some things like that is things like send file and case splice where you can kind of glue file descriptors together so that you, one data that comes in through one just goes out through the other without you having to do anything. Um, but the, the sort of the important part of this is that in all the Unix behavior that sits behind a file descriptor, that once you get past the first layer, it tends to be quite divergent. And so if you're going to do anything interesting like this, you have to implement the behavior behind it for everything that needs to be done with it. Um, I can't speak to Linux in any detail, but in FreeBSD, free uh, each file descriptor ha it just indexes into an array which has a file structure which then contains a, an operations vector and you just go off and do whatever it tells you. And the upshot of that is that behavior that you want to implement for a file system file can be quite different to the behavior that you want to implement for a socket. And if you want to add new behaviors, you then have to develop this for all of them at the, you know, as you do it. Um, and it thing, means that uh, things like uh, blocking and asynchrony end up getting handled differently very, uh, very early in the, the piece and potentially inconsistently. So, Back in the day, there used to be a company called Digital Equipment Corporation, or DEC. One of its claims to fame is that it made the PDP series of mini-computers that Unix was originally, originally developed on. Another one is it made VAX, the VAX line, and that's where VMS comes in. Um, Unix did exist for the VAX, but DEC sold VMS for it. One of the people who worked on VMS was named Dave Cutler, and he also went on to help develop Windows NT. He's very famously not a fan of Unix's I.O. model. Um, Windows, as in the Windows we know today, not 3.195, whatever, derives its I.O. model from VMS to some extent. Um, the core of this I.O. model is that I.O. requests are all described by a data structure called, a data structure called an I.O. request packet, or an ERP. Um, ERPs not only encapsulate all the arguments for an I.O. request, but they can be queued, and they can also incorporate information on how to notify the requester once the job's done. Um, this means that ERPs can easily be made both non-blocking and asynchronous without too much trouble. Um, they can also get routed to other components and can be modified or retargeted. So file system drivers can take ERPs and turn them into new ERPs that can sent to storage devices and so on and so forth. Um, it's very flexible. Um, and the primary difference between that and the Unix model is that the Windows model might be a lot more complex to deal with, but it gives you a lot more flexibility. Um, the FreeBSD I.O. path, once you get down into the file system operations, looks a bit like that. You're sort of hand, handing a request around between various layers. Um, but the model for sockets is not like that way at all. Um, whether this kind of model's a win or not really depends on taste and a bunch of other things. But it's a really interesting thing to look at. And um, it also, a model like that that's more formalized and abstracted um, might be, end up being quite useful in a world where a lot of I.O. is starting to look quite similar in a lot of ways. Um, it would be quite interesting to see an I.O. system that actually extended the ERP style interface all the way up into user space and beyond. But enough about software, let's talk about hardware. Um, hardware I.O. is basically pushing electrical signals around, except when it's pushing photons around, but the photons came later, so let's talk about electrons. Um, there are a bunch of iterations of things that we call electronic computers before we start seeing things that start to resemble what we consider computers today. Um, eventually, you kind of land on a thing that has a bunch of processing logic, uh, some kind of online storage, which we refer to these days as RAM, 
Um, you'd have some way of getting programs into the machine. This could be uh, such fun things as plug boards or front panel toggles or punch cards. Um, some way of feeding data to the machine, which might be the same thing as you use to get the program in, and then some way of getting information out of it. Um, the, and these kind of the, these early I/O devices are often baked into the architecture of the machine itself. For instance, uh, the instruction sets of early IBM mainframes had opcodes for reading punch cards. Um, fairly early on, you start to see a memory hierarchy emerge. Um, memory hierarchy refers to the fact that things that are things that are fast are not often cheap, and uh, things that are cheap are not often fast. And so you get some of each, and then you move things from the slow stuff to the fast stuff and, and deal with it that way. Um, in the case of early machines, you often had some faster magnetic core memory and slower drum memory. This is a, uh, on the left here, you've got a drum memory. Um, it's kind of a precursor to a hard drive. Uh, it's a magnetic surface with read and write heads. Um, and then up in the top there, you've got some magnetic core memory. Um, which is uh, made of little um, magnetic toroids that could be magnetized in one of two directions and you could work out which direction you would magnetized it. Um, in another piece of trivia, drum, machine, drum memory actually persisted longer than you would expect and early Unix machines often used it as swap. Um, so transistorization comes along and along comes a semiconductor RAM. This is an Intel RAM module. Um, the general principles of dynamic RAM have remained fairly similar, but the way they connect to the CPU has changed quite a bit over time. Um, so the earliest computers were somewhat ad hoc in structure. You often had several cabinets which held different bits of the system. So you might have your arithmetic, your ALU, your control unit, various things all hooked up together. Um, these were interconnected with lots and lots of different cables. And then to power these things, you'd have big metal bars that carried power that you'd uh, attach cables to and then plug into the cabinets. Um, these were called bus bars. Um, when computers started getting more tightly integrated, the notion of a bus also got extended into the notion of how you connected things together within the system. So we move from that kind of thing to this, which is closer to early kind of PC and embedded system architecture. Because um, most of the, the, when you look at an early CPU, uh, you know, early 80, 86, 80, 88 kind of CPUs, they've got a lot less pins than we have now. And most of those pins were for talking to memory. Um, you'd have a bunch of address pins, uh, a bunch of data pins, and then you'd have some control, uh, some control logic as well. And that was the CPU's primary and sometimes only way of communicating with anything. And so how did the CPU communicate with other devices? Well, you'd either have a separate address space for them, which is where you get um, the notion of I.O. ports, if you, if you remember those, um, or you just stick them on the memory bus and, and make them pretend to be memory, uh, which is what we refer to as memory mapped I.O. Um, combine that with some kind of interrupt mechanism, you've got everything you need, um, especially since CPUs generally had an address range that exceeded the amount of RAM that you could actually connect to them, with 32-bit uh, x86 being an obvious exception to that <laughs> by now. Um, simpler embedded systems still work like this, and the problem with that, though, is that you're very dependent on the CPU for moving data around within the system, which can create performance bottlenecks. Um, which leads to the idea of direct memory access, or DMA. Um, so DMA often shows up in two forms. Um, one form is the one that's common in embedded systems, where you have a DMA controller that resides within the system memory controller and allows the CPU to tell it to move stuff around. Um, that allows you to do things like the CPU can say, right, copy that block of memory over there, I'm going to go do something else. Um, and the other form allows a device itself to take control of the memory bus and write stuff itself into memory. Um, this requires a fair amount of complexity in the memory controller, though, uh, which is why in, um, in earlier systems it, it's usually its own device. So having gone through some of the basics of I.O. at the CPU and bus level, um, so th yeah, this kind of setup was pretty common. Um, hang on, I'm just going to skip this slide. And this one. This is an IBM PC motherboard. Um, so. The, set, the setup I described with the uh, memory controller and the, and the CPU is, is uh, pretty much what the IBM PC did. Uh, that's the CPU uh, just here, I think. Um. <laughs> so 
The expansion on this system, which is these slots here, was an 8-bit uh, slot that IBM called IO Channel, which is a precursor to ISA. Um, it had a set of address and data pins that mirrored the 8088 CPU. Uh, the bus speed was exactly the same as the CPU speed, which was 4.77 megahertz. Um, the bus had some extra pins for providing power and wiring up interrupts and stuff, and there was an interrupt controller and a DMA controller on the board. And, you know, that's where we start with the PC. Um, ISA, as we know it, uh, came along with the PCAT and was a 16-bit extension of that that went along with the 286. Um, but when the 386 came along, two things happened. The first thing is that the CPU moved from 16 to 32-bit, and the second is the bus speed began to seriously decouple from the CPU speed, with the speed of the bus really not keeping up. And so by the time the 486 comes along, this leads to a couple of several, uh, a couple of competing replacements. Uh, the top one here is an eISA card, which was developed by Compaq, and the bottom one is a microchannel card that was developed by IBM. Um, both of them tried to solve multiple problems, including bus speed, bus width, and another problem that was starting to plague people, which is uh, how you discover and configure devices that are plugged into your system. Um, historically, computer configuration was fairly static. You bought a computer and you didn't really touch it all that much. Um, adding and removing devices didn't really happen very often. And on top of this, devices only had limited ways to work out what address ranges, I.O. ports and interrupts they should use. Um, this could lead to conflicts with too many things trying to share interrupt lines or whatever. And so this leads to things like the... Who, who remembers playing games back in the DOS era where you had to go in and configure your, uh, your sound and everything? Um, and so this played in with, with a whole bunch of things leading to um, things like this where you'd get everything set up and then you'd have to make sure it worked. And then, Your sound card works perfectly. But this is Blizzard. Your sound card works perfectly. And so in Blizzard, when you repeatedly your click on things, works perfectly. it gets annoyed. Enjoying yourself? <laughs> your sound card and if you keep perfectly. going, it gets really annoyed. Your sound card works perfectly. Your sound card works perfectly. And it tells you... It doesn't get any better than this. <laughs> <laughs> so... Another thing that showed up at this point was a Visa local bus. Um, this was purely aimed at the graphics market, and we're talking about 1992 here. So graphics has been causing problems for a long time. <laughs> it's all his... No, it's not his fault. Um, so VLB was an extension to ISA that provided a very fast extra memory path between the CPU and the device. Apart from that, it was basically just ISA. It, too, was heavily built around the 486's memory controller design, and which is part of the reason why it died, because the Pentium showed up. Um, this is a PCI card. But by this point, CPU bus had evolved to being nothing like ISA or eISA, and so you always had some kind of bus, some kind of intermediary between the CPU and I.O. devices. Um, and PCI basically acknowledged this and didn't take the CPU front side into, into account very much at all. Um, it also took a bunch of the good ideas that came from EISA and MCA, um, a bunch of these showing up in the concept of configuration space. Um, the PCI bus has three address spaces, I.O. ports, which is one of the things it did bring over from the old ones, um, memory, system memory, and device configuration. So every device has a set of registers exposed via that that contains its identification, um, the kinds of things that it needs to be, have be configured up and all that kind of thing. PCI also enabled uh, much more use of things like bridges where you could have uh, subsidiary buses to allow further expansion. Um, the problem with PCI is that eventually its throughput couldn't keep pace with those problems children over in graphics land, um, which led to the invention of AGP, which was to PCI what VLB was to ISA. Um, which is a fast path to memory for a specific device. But on top of that, improving the bus became, became to get even more difficult because PCI was parallel. Um, parallel buses sound great because you can transfer a whole bunch of bits in one clock cycle. Um, DDR4 can do up to 16 bits per clock cycle per line. But keeping all those lines in sync is hard. And stopping crosstalk between those lines is hard. And it's only made worse in the case of things like um, PCI, where you've got multiple things on the same set of wires. Um, RAM gets around this by just being really tight on tolerances. Um, but PCI had to deal with a whole bunch of you know, weird stuff showing up in various ways. And, it, and 
they eventually solved it by removing the parallelism to some extent. So this is a PCI Express card. It's called PCIe because PCIx was already used. Um, it's also, unlike PCI, a bunch of point-to-point -point serial links, uh, which are referred to as lanes, which is where you get the X1, X4, X8 type terminology. Lanes get grouped together to form a connection between devices. And obviously this looks nothing like a memory bus now. Um, and so now you've got things like root complexes that handle the, the transition between the PCI Express bus onto the various systematic uh, system things. So often you'll have a CPU, a memory controller and a PCI root complex on the CPU die itself these days with a bunch of PCI Express lanes coming directly off the CPU to go to some problem child graphics card. And, uh, and then a bunch of other things that go off into other I.O. parts of the system. Um, and on top of this, um, with the serial connection, the uh, communications protocol is now packetized. And when you actually bring the extra use of bridges into play, your computer itself is now a packetized switched network. Um, and, but it's worth noting that even as PCI evolves uh, from the previous you know, buses and then turns into PCI Express, the actual way that operating systems tend to program it hasn't changed all that much. Configuration space is still there. Interrupts are handled a bit differently now. They're generally done as memory writes rather than just uh, raising a, a pin on, a, on the bus. But a lot of it is still quite common. Um, and it's also worth noting, just as an aside, that uh, pretty much every PC still has something that's programmatically equivalent to an ISA bus in it. Um, a bunch of systemic things like timers and serial ports and things like that tend to hang off that. Um, so even though we're more than 30 years after the original PC, there's still a little bit of its DNA floating around in there. And while we're on the subject of packetized switch networks, let's talk about CPUs. Um, this is a shot of um, Intel high core count silicon block diagram. Each one of these little boxes here is a, a CPU core. Uh, that's a memory controller. And there's a PCI Express controller at the top. So they, they work over this ring bus, but with the high core count designs, they had to move to two of them. And these are switches. And the, uh, the protocol between the cores and everything is indeed packetized. So your CPU is also a packetized switch network. And it even gets better in later silicon. This is a newer version of it. This is a mesh network. Whoa. So CPUs are complex, which is why meltdown happens. Um, so, let's talk about hard drives. This is the first commercial hard drive, the IBM 350. Um, it was an optional extra for the IBM 305 that was released in 1956. Uh, there was a later version called an IBM 355 that went with an IBM 650. It stored 5 million 6-bit characters, giving you a grand total of 3.75 megabytes. It was a, it was a uh, tiny and easily manageable 60 inches long, 68 inches high, and 29 inches wide, and weighed about a ton. It contained 50 24-inch platters, each of which could hold data on each side for a total of 100 recording surfaces, each with 100 tracks. Uh, the internal mechanism had only two heads, though, one for an upper surface and one for a lower surface, so these had to move to the right platter and then seek to the right track. Uh, this, uh, this lovely behemoth would uh, set you back... Um, Hang on, you could lease a 305 with one of these for $3,200 uh, in 1950. That's about $30,000 a month in today's money. Um, so how did you talk to this thing? Well, as I described earlier with the punch card readers, uh, these weren't the same kind of standardised command sets that we're used to. You had a seek instruction. Uh, on the mainframe that would move the heads into position and then you could issue read and write instructions to pull data into memory, drum memory in the case of the 305 or the 650 had magnetic core so it was obviously the better one. But as you can imagine this isn't exactly fast. Um, another interesting thing about early hard drives is uh, that for a while you could actually take the, uh, the collection of platters and sometimes even the heads out and replace them so you had the removable hard drives but not the actual hard drive just the, the bit in the inside. Um, so you get this interesting sequence of evolution that starts with enormous statically configured devices like the 350, moves uh, over the years to these removable disk packs, um, and then as the recording densities increased and the devices became smaller, they, they sort of reintegrated again. Another interesting thing about this time is the things like the IBM 7631. Uh, this was the interface point between an IBM 1301 
which was another hard drive, um, up to five of these, um, and some combination of uh, IBM 1401 or 7000 series computers. Um, this is interesting because it's the first time you see control hardware placed between a host and one or more hard drives. Um, the 7631 had four instructions you could, the computer could send to it, which were basically control, read, write, and sense. Uh, control would essentially open a file by specifying an address uh, and uh, along with some other parameters. Read and write are fairly obvious and sense would report on the status of the system, which starts to look a bit more like what we expect out of these things. Um, as for the drive itself, the 1301 could have either one or two modules, each storing um, 28 million characters. And a two module 1301 with a 7631 would set you back about $241,000 in 1961 or about two million in today's money. These are all US dollars, by the way, in case it matters. Um, if you continue along the evolution of the mainframe, and you know, the mainframes still do exist in the form of IBM Z series, um, the I.O. interfaces between the computer and the storage, and in some cases other things, evolved into the notion of channel I.O. Channel I.O. had a channel processor in between the CPU and storage and possibly other devices, and this had its own set of instructions, um, which you could, so you could program it on the fly to go and do I.O. tasks for you, which is kind of a, a uh, depending on how you look at it, it's either a really, really fancy DMA controller or the precursor to the Windows ERP style structure that I described before. Um, so jumping back over to the microcomputer side, um, this was the hard drive that shipped in the original PC XT. This is an ST4412, which is a successor to the ST506. Uh, these are interesting because they're the first drives that fit in the same five and a quarter inch bay as a floppy drive. Um, the PC talked to the drive via a controller and the protocol between the controller and the drive was based on the PC floppy disk interface. And so it was very simple and thus very cheap. Um, it, also, it became pretty much an industry standard. You'll see references to the ST506 protocol. Um, but then you move to um, IDE and ATA. So this was a software compatible rework of that ST506 controller. Um, the interesting part though is that IDE stands for Integrated Drive Electronics, referring to the fact that the, for the first time the controller aspect of this was actually integrated onto the drive itself. Um, the ATA cards of the time were really just bridges between the ISA bus and the drive, which is where the name ATA or AT attachment comes from. Um, the controller just presents the drive to the system as an array of, of 512 byte blocks and has a really simple set of commands for dealing with them. Um, all the work of actually telling the heads to seek to certain locations was all, all up to the drive now. Um, so moving the control logic to the drive relieves the CPU of a bunch of work, but it's the ATA, drive, ATA protocol is still fairly work intensive because you can only really issue one command at a time. Um, so SCSI made drives even smarter. SCSI refers to a whole swathe of things. One of them is a bunch of physical interface standards, but a bunch of them is, uh, the rest of them are all the protocols to talk to things over it. Um, and it too went through the same um, sort of progression of for the, through parallel interfaces into serial interfaces. But it had uh, far more of a notion that drive IO was something that happened while you were doing something else. So you could queue commands uh, to go and do stuff and then just deal with the data as it came in, um, which made much more efficient use of time. Um, it was more, a lot more expensive though, which is why a lot of things tended to use ATA rather than SCSI. Um, so over time, computers get faster, drives get faster, parallel ATA gets to ultra DMA, um, but ultra DMA is still, uh, you'd run into the same problem as PCI with uh, parallel things, uh, bit, with the crosstalk and the parallel connections which, were mean, which was why with ultra DMA you had to go to the 80 wire cables instead of 40 wire cables because even though you didn't hook up those other 40 wires, they were just there to insulate the wires so that you could actually talk properly. And so this leads to the same outcome which is everything goes to serial again. Um, so serial ATA can go much, high, much faster, uh, up to two gigabytes a second or further, although it's worth not noting that um, uh, mechanical hard drives can't get anywhere near that. Um, it also uh, converges uh, ATA and SCSI to some extent. Almost anything that can talk SAS, which is serial attached SCSI, can also talk SATA these days. But the connectors are deliberately kept a little bit different because it doesn't go the other way. 
Um, so, but like the move uh, from parallels to serial in uh, the PCI space, the programming interfaces don't actually look that much different. The controller interfaces have changed a bit, but the notions that uh, the, no the notion of how you talk to these things hasn't changed all that much. ATA has gained some command queuing, but you know it's not that uh, not that much different. And after hard drives comes flash, and flash is interesting because it's a lot faster. Um, as far as reads go, it's zero, pe zero penalty for random access. It's also just a lot faster at moving stuff around. Um, so eventually flash becomes cheap enough that you could become primary disk storage. And initially this was done by hooking a bunch of flash up to a controller that speaks uh, serial ATA. Um, but that really sells it short because it's, it's way, it, it can talk much faster than that interface will let it. And to get around this, some people started attaching flash directly to the PCI bus and eventually standardized this with uh, NVMe or non-volatile memory express interface. Um, so AHCI is the ATA host controller interface, NVMHCI is the non-volatile memory host controller interface. There's a lot of HCIs these days. Uh, the main difference between the two uh, from a practical level is that the NVMe allows a lot more queues, a lot more command queues. Uh, and we're talking like 65,535 versus one. Um, with a lot more commands in each queue, 65,536 versus 32. Um, and NVMe doesn't require interlocking between the AHCI controller and the host in order to submit commands. Um, so it allows you to talk to your flash a lot faster than the original SATA interfaces did. And then interestingly, this leads to how can you hook a bunch of these up to a system? So storage oriented systems often have an HBA of some kind talking to a bunch of drives. Um, you could hook a bunch of SATA SSDs up to these since almost all HBAs these days support both SAS and SATA. But newer HBAs can actually switch between SATA, SAS and NVMe, which means they're actually talking PCI Express. And combine that with the fact that, that you know, most of the time HBAs support mo many more drives than they can physically connect and thus use other drives called port, other things called port multipliers to connect further. It's a, it's a packetized switch network. Um, but wait, there's more. Um, because modern NICs can also offload storage functions. Um, you get fiber channel over Ethernet and iSCSI, which means your storage can literally be over a packetized switch network. Um, and that's before you even get to NVMF, which is NVMe over fabrics. So let's talk about the future-ish. Thunderbolt's already here, but it's interesting to look at as an, from an IO perspective. It's basically a way to multiplex PCI Express and display port packets over a single connector. Um, it's yet another high-speed serial link making use of all of the signal conditioning technology and stuff that's allowed all of the other serial interfaces that we use. Um, but the interesting evolution of that from my, from my point of view is that it envisions a world where things are expanded externally rather than internally. Um, which leads to, you know, me carrying around a pile of dongles, but I still think that's a quite an interesting thing. Um, RDMA is another interesting thing. Uh, it's also been around for a while, but it used to be limited to uh, higher speed fabrics like InfiniBand, and it's only in the last several years that it's been available in uh, Ethernet NIC products in the forms of things like Rocky and iWarp. Um, RDMA lets you copy slabs of memory from one system to another with very little overhead, especially when your NIC has an offload for it. Um, which is uh, very useful when you're doing things like you know, huge compute and things like that. Um, DPDK, or the Data Plane Development Kit, is a software stack that came out of Intel a while back. Um, it allows you to effectively map queues from your network card into user space and handle the packets yourself from user space. Um, so you can do like things like fast packet analysis. You're seeing all the packets come through in the queue. You can just pull them out and do stuff. Some people go as far as doing things like writing their own TCP stacks in user space and doing the whole thing in there, which has some benefits if you do it the right way. I wouldn't recommend it for everyone, but it's an interesting option to have. Um, and the last interesting uh, one is NVDIMs or non-volatile DIMs. So we're talking Intel's Optane or things like 3D Crosspoint. These are the evolution of flash past the point of being a secondary storage device into being a primary storage device. So they replace your RAM. And so you now have RAM that doesn't lose all of its contents when you turn the power off. Um, to say that this makes file system design an interesting question is, is underselling things a little bit. Um, but you know, it'll be interesting to see how this goes. Um, so 
yep, this is the end. This is where everything has turned out to be something else. So NICs are now storage controllers and DMA controllers and storage controllers are PCI bridges. Your TCP stack is now in user space and everything is a packetized switch network. <laughs> Thank you. And I think, did I come in a bit early? Yep. All right. I, I, I may take one or two questions then if yes. people have any. But nobody has any questions, so I won't. Oh, there they go. Got it. Uh, let's start there. Uh, if you want to know more about NDME, my talk's tomorrow. I'll, I'll talk today. That's not a question. That's a sales pitch. <laughs> So the question was, um, how soon until I can bridge my CPU, the sw packetized switch network in my CPU to the packetized switch network on the WAN? Um, the joking answer would be that, that Meltdown has you there. Um, um, that's an interesting one because it's just, you, you effectively have to cover so many uh, hops from technology to technology to get there that really what you'd end up looking like is what you've already got in terms of a computer. Because it, the question was why would he want to do that, and the answer is because it's funny. So the question was uh, with NVDIMs and things like that, are we back to having uh, the situation at the beginning of the whole thing with uh, drum memory and stuff like that? Um, or magnetic core memory, yes, thank you. Um, to some extent, yes, but the, the, I mean, the real difference is that it's now so much faster. Um, so you could view it as architecturally similar, um, but I would say that once you're talking about like, you know, if you've got 18 cores of Xeon there, uh, all with all with cache coherency and things like that, it doesn't look anything like uh, your old sort of enormous pile of cabinets. Any more? One more. If, if you'd like to know about how we are going to put the network into user space onto your CPU, please come to my talk. <laughs> with that, thank you thank very much. Note. With that, thank you very much. Oh, thank you.